Good evening, and thank you very much for coming. I'm Paul Hall, the president of the UC Santa Cruz Foundation. I'm proud to be a graduate of Merrill College, class of 72, and also a proud parent. My daughter just graduated uh, last December from this fine school. Uh, when I'm not here in Santa Cruz, my day job is as a litigation partner at the law firm of DLA Piper in San Francisco. Uh, this is the second lecture in the UC Hastings Social Justice Speaker Series. Last April, the inaugural lecture by Morris Ratner about his prosecution of Holocaust-era legal claims against European companies that profited from Nazi atrocities, um, he spoke to a very large group uh, the lecture was very well received. Uh, we're hoping to put together an equally good program this evening and throughout the remainder of this social justice speaker series. Continuing in that vein of important work, of taking on powerful adversaries, speaking truth to power, and seeking justice, we'll hear tonight from Dean Beth Hillman about sexual assault in the military and the alternative policy alternatives for tackling that problem. This lecture is part of the UC Santa Cruz and UC Hastings Law School 3 plus 3 program. It's a brand new program in which UC Santa Cruz and UC Hastings Law School have collaborated to put together a six-year BA and JD program instead of the usual seven years. The idea is to be able to attend UC Santa Cruz for three years, then go on to law school for another three years and get the two degrees in six instead of seven years. Uh, it has just been approved by both schools uh, and the University of California as a whole. Uh, and uh, about 100 interested students attended our fall orientation. I want to talk for a moment about the UC Santa Cruz and UC Hastings partnership. They really are natural partners as institutions with similar values. They both have a very strong focus on social justice. One example here at UC Santa Cruz is Professor Craig Haney. Craig is a professor of psychology and director of the Legal Studies Program at Santa Cruz. He studies the psychological impacts of long-term incarceration and the improper use of long-term solitary confinement in our prisons. Uh, he's the leading scholar in the country in that field. His work is cited by defense attorneys all over the country. And indeed, my wife, who's a criminal defense attorney, um, knows his work and says, literally, everybody in the country uses his work. Craig was just named the distinguished 2014 faculty research lecturer at our Founders Day celebration. And he has been very involved in the 3 plus 3 program on this campus. Another example of our social justice involvement in the law is our information technology students um, sharing their IT skills with nonprofits around the globe, empowering community activists, healthcare workers, educators, and environmentalists. Our engineers develop robotics technology for stroke victims um, and technology that can be used for military veterans. The UC Hastings Law School social justice concentration or specialization, uh, one of those specializations focuses on uh, providing legal services for underrepresented citizens who have little access to legal services. The point of all, all this is that UC Santa Cruz and UC Hastings can do more together than on their own. Tonight's lecture has a number of fine organizations sponsoring it, uh, all of whom I want to thank. Here at UC Santa Cruz, sponsors are the Legal Studies Program, the Division of Social Sciences, the Institute for Humanities Research, the Politics Department, the Feminist Studies Department, and the Philosophy Department. UC Hastings College of the Law, of course, is a sponsor, as is the Santa Cruz County Bar Association, the Women Lawyers of Santa Cruz County, Santa Cruz County Trial Lawyers Association, Monarch Services, the City of Santa Cruz Commission for Prevention of Violence Against Women, the Women's Commission of Santa Cruz County, and the Diversity Center. I want to thank all of them. A couple of logistical notes uh, about tonight's program. 
first, for lawyers in the audience, uh, this program is eligible for continuing legal education credit, and if you need to get that form, there's a table set up in the lobby where you can register and get your form for CLE credit. And then I want to talk about questions and answers. This is a really important topic that has been much in the news. Uh, people may have diverse perspectives. We greatly value your questions. About a half an hour into the program, ushers will circulate uh, among you uh, to take uh, questions that you've jotted, jotted down on a card. Uh, people should have passed out cards and pencils for, for questions, uh, and if you don't have a card, uh, please raise your hand now and ushers will spot you and, and bring you cards so that you can jot down questions. Uh, anyhow, about a half an hour into the program, ushers will collect those cards, uh, bring them to me, and then uh, I will facilitate uh, questions at the end when Dean Hillman is done speaking. If you would, so this, this program, as I mentioned, is part of the 3 plus 3 program between UC Santa Cruz and UC Hastings. It's a really innovative program that allows students to get their BA and JD one year earlier. It's a great expense savings, and it's also great for students who know what they want to do and are prepared to do it on an accelerated track. If you would like to support this innovative program, we'd love to hear from you. Our students need mentors, internships, and scholarship support. So please let us know, and together we can help students navigate their way to success and achieve their goals. Now, it is great, my great pleasure to introduce the visionary professor, professor behind the 3 plus 3 program, as well as this social justice speaker series, Professor Kelly Weisberg of UC Hastings Law School. Uh, Kelly is doing so much for our students, uh, and indeed, here at Santa Cruz, she just organized a legal clinic for undocumented students. Uh, it is my pleasure to work closely with Kelly and now to introduce her for this evening's program. Thank you, Paul, and thank you all for joining us here tonight. It's an honor to support this campus and its students with efforts like the 3 plus 3 program. Paul mentioned the legal clinic that we hosted recently here for DREAMers, our undocumented students. This clinic was yet another joint effort between UC Santa Cruz and UC Hastings. And what a remarkable collaboration it was. We had a dozen UC Santa Cruz students who turned out to help their fellow undocumented students. We had almost two dozen Hastings students come to campus to, uh, to give their efforts to help UC Santa Cruz undocumented students under the supervision of Hastings law professor, immigration law professor Richard Boswell. And we had nine local Santa Cruz immigration attorneys who shared their expertise to help our students to obtain relief from deportation and work authorization so that they can find jobs to fund their education. It goes to show that it takes a village to accomplish change, and what an incredible humanitarian village we have right here. Tonight's speaker is someone who has worked tirelessly to effectuate social change on the national level. Beth Hillman is academic dean and provost at UC Hastings College of the Law. She is also a crusader. Her topic, sexual assault in the military, has been making national headlines for some time. The epidemic of sexual assault in the military, 26,000 sexual assaults in 2012, demands our attention. This crisis brings together a combustible mix of violence, gender, and power at the intersection of our military and civilian cultures. This crisis is a clarion call for reform, for we must do something to protect those who are sworn to protect us. 
Dean Hillman is a perfect speaker for our Social Justice Speaker Series. She is a leader who is driven by a desire for justice, as well as by a deep sense of compassion. When she was called upon recently to welcome the first-year students at Hastings, she encouraged them to develop a sense of compassion. Compassion not only for them as future lawyers, but also she encouraged them to have compassion for their families, for she reminded them that they are going through this experience right along with them. When I talked to her staff at Hastings, I asked them, please tell me something that I can share with our audience here tonight. Something about your boss. And her staff highlighted her personal interest in each one of them and in their families, and also her sense of compassion. I feel so fortunate to have Beth as a colleague and privileged to tell you a little bit about her background. She joined the Air Force ROTC to pay for college. She earned a degree in electrical engineering at Duke University before enlisting in the Air Force. Seven years later, she left the military to become a scholar. She earned a law degree and a PhD in history at Yale University. She taught history, the Air Force Academy, and also at Yale. And she taught law at Rutgers Camden before joining the faculty at Hastings. She began working in the area of military sexual assault while she was researching topics for her dissertation. She learned about Korean War rape cases and was stunned at their numbers and their ferocity. That discovery led to the focus of her scholarship ever since. Her current scholarship focuses on military law, history, and culture, topics about which she has published two books, as well as chapters, articles, and reports. An award-winning teacher and a sought-after speaker, she has testified before congressional committees, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, as well as served as an expert witness on topics of military justice, sexual orientation, and gender in the United States Armed Forces. For some time, she has been working with national lawmakers to change the law on sexual assault in the military. In 2013, she was appointed by Congressman Adam Smith, ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee, to serve on the response systems to adult sexual assault crimes panel an independent panel chartered by Congress to study and make recommendations about sexual assault in the military. Appointed chair of that panel subcommittee, Dean Hillman led the preparation and drafting of a comprehensive report recommending significant changes to improve the military response to sexual assault, changes that she will share with us tonight. She is fortunate to have influential partners in her work including Northern California Congresswoman Jackie Speer, a Hastings alum, I'm very proud to add. Congresswoman Speer was unable to be with us this evening, but she feels so strongly about the topic of sexual assault in the military, and she feels so strongly about the important work that Beth Hillman has done, that she wanted to record a video welcome with an introduction of Dean Hillman. Now, please join me in watching Congresswoman Jackie Speer. Good evening, I'm Congresswoman Jackie Speer, and I wish I could be there in person to participate in tonight's Social Justice Speaker Series. As a Hastings alum myself, I am pleased that the innovative collaboration between UC Santa Cruz and UC Hastings has brought together so many of you, future leaders. You are about to hear how each of you can have an impact on ending the epidemic of military sexual assault. From tonight's distinguished speaker, Dean Elizabeth Hillman. Dean Hillman is a leading legal mind in military justice. Her work and insights have been invaluable in shaping the debate for reforming the military justice system and moving it into the 21st century. 
Dean Hillman continues to give those of us in Congress working to reform the military justice system the ammunition we need to move the debate forward and debunk the arguments that commanders with no legal training should be making legal decisions. Dean Hillman shares my mission to implement fundamental reforms to bring an antiquated and inherently unfair military justice system in line with civilian courts. For many years now, I've shared dozens of stories on the floor of the House of Representatives about rape and sexual assault survivors in the military who have faced an unfair system where they are often treated as the criminal with the perpetrators facing little consequences for their horrendous crimes. The military's own numbers expose the appalling failure of its approach to allow sexual assault cases to be handled within the chain of command. The DOD's most recent estimate indicates that in 2012, more than 26,000 service members were sexually assaulted. And last year, of the 5,000 reports of sexual assault, 1,293 were restricted, meaning no investigation was prompted and no perpetrator identified or punished. Of the 5,000 reports, only 838 cases ever went to trial and 370 were convicted. And of those, only 274 perpetrators spent any time in jail. It's no mystery why the reporting rate is so low. The message is clear. If you report a sexual assault, Chances are that you will be punished and ostracized rather than your perpetrator brought to justice. Your actions will almost guarantee the end of your military career. Countless scandals, media attention, and the documentary Invisible War, however, have brought the attention of the public to this issue. It is becoming more and more difficult for the military and Congress to repackage more of the same policies to address this problem and call them real reforms. The majority of Americans agree that sexual assault cases should be taken out of the chain of command. Military brass aren't going to implement these policies to fix this problem. Congress and advocates like you here tonight need to change the system for them. In 2013, the Response System to Adult Sexual Assault Crimes panel was mandated by Congress and called for by the Secretary of Defense. It created a subcommittee to study the epidemic of military sexual assault, but unfortunately its findings were to stick with the status quo and continue to let commanders decide whether reports will be pursued. In the nine-person panel's report, the majority agreed that there was not enough evidence to support a conclusion that removing the cases out of the chain of command would either reduce the incidence or increase the reporting of sexual assault in the military. But Dean Hillman was one of the two dissenting voices on the panel. Her courageous decision to write a dissenting opinion that commanders with no legal expertise are neither essential nor well suited for their current role in the legal process of criminal prosecution um, must change. And I emphatically concur. I'm honored to introduce to you Dean Elizabeth Hillman from UC Hastings College of the Law. Dean Hillman embodies what true leadership is about. She's not guided but by what is expedient, popular, or easy, but what is right. Her articulate and passionate leadership on ridding the military of sexual assault has truly moved the ball forward. Thank you for being here, and I hope you have a great evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to UC Hastings Academic Dean and Provost Beth Hillman. I think I should just go home now. <laughs> but then you wouldn't get CLE credit, so I, I won't do that. I want to thank Paul, I want to thank Kelly um, for the generous introduction. Kelly, we all owe thanks to uh, for being a visionary in terms of the connections between UC Santa Cruz and UC Hastings, but also for being a role model for me and many others in her own work in domestic violence related to the topic that we'll talk about here tonight. I also want to thank the terrific team of support personnel here at UC Santa Cruz. I'm unaccustomed. Um, I'm accustomed to great support, but not quite so much as what we're getting here, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, 
we might have to make some changes back at home. I, I also want to thank uh, Jackie Spear. Congresswoman Spear has been an extraordinarily fierce advocate, and I think you can tell from listening to her there that she's not done with this fight, although many would say um, we haven't been winning more recently on the uh, particular reforms that she sees as most important. But her work on this has been uh, a part of what I'll talk about tonight in bringing you, you, you here to be interested in the issue and so many others as well. I do want to thank you for taking time to learn about this issue. It's not always easy for me to explain why this has become the focus of my own scholarship and advocacy efforts. In fact, maybe it's toughest to explain to my kids um, who say, what do you work on again? And last year when I spent too much time probably in Washington, D.C., working on this panel, uh, I did try to articulate why it mattered and why it was worth this sort of attention. For you all to be here tonight to learn more about this issue says volumes about what matters to you in terms of protecting not only service members, but all of those who suffer from sexual violence in our worlds today. So, let's see if I can do this. Hmm, we have two. Let's go back. Let's see if I can try that again. Well, I have two lines there. Let's see. I've, um, that's not an especially important slide, so let me just summarize it quickly and I'll move on. So this is, um, this is an outline. I, I did learn to give briefings when I was in the Air Force. Uh, you heard some of that military background of mine. The Air Force always tells you, and all the services, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you said. So I'm not quite following that at the end, but I am going to start with that. So this is what I'm going to tell you, but hopefully the middle won't be quite as garbled as that looks. Um, first. Uh, in terms of understanding sexual assault in the military, the first thing we need to talk about is why this has come to center stage in the United States. Because I have to say, unfortunately, in many respects, it's not there in the rest of the world's militaries. It ought to be. It's an issue and a problem that's not being dealt with uh, effectively. But here in the United States, it has captured political, legal reform attention, and I want to talk about why. The second thing I wanted to talk about that uh, says improving the responses. So improving responses in the military is much like improving responses in civilian criminal justice systems. But there's some spe special factors that alter how the armed forces should and has responded. And I want to talk about those. And then finally, I'll spend a little time on asking the right questions. Since I think that understanding this arena is quite challenging, because of the difficulty of understanding what has happened and what is happening now. And I want to explain why that is. So this first seizing center stage, how did we get to a place where Congresswoman Speer, where Senator Gillibrand, where uh, Senator, now Senator-elect Joni Ernst um, are talking about this issue? So Senator Ernst, the first woman um, elected senator from the state of Iowa, is a military veteran who actually during her campaign um, in Iowa said that she was sexually harassed while she was in the military. And she also came out as a supporter of Senator Gillibrand's uh, effort to take the control of criminal prosecution decisions away from commanding officers. So just this week, uh, we have another advocate potentially for change in, in the uh, United States Congress. I'd like to talk about not only how Congress has, has come to this issue, but also how the public discourse has been changed through popular culture primarily, and also how data has affected this. So the first thing to talk about here is the invisible war. Congresswoman Speer mentioned this film, and I imagine some of you have seen it. How many of you have seen The Invisible War? A, a, a solid minority of folks have seen this documentary. This was released in 2012. Uh, it was shown in many, on, it has been used as a training tool on military bases now. It has also been used as an advocacy tool, and it has galvanized support for change in the armed forces with respect to military sexual assault. This documentary is a collection of stories, the narratives of uh, five or six individuals interspersed with experts talking about their experiences with failed prosecutions of, of sex offenders in the military. Although the Invisible War brought the attention that led to all the legislative action I'll talk to you about is certainly at the center of this, it's far from the only element of popular culture that has looked at military sexual assault. There are actually many movies in which this appears. Uh, perhaps the worst is the 1999 The General's Daughter, starring John Travolta. Um, perhaps the best known representation is this. It's certainly the longest running. So Doonesbury, between 2007 and 2013, ran a series of strips with the most prominent military veteran uh, in the strip for many, many years. 
uh, she was a victim of sexual assault, a particular kind of sexual assault, sexual assault that involves the betrayal of a commanding officer, which certainly has been set up as the archetype of, of sexual assault in the armed forces, most akin to the impact of being assaulted by a member of one's own family. That's a parallel that's explicitly made in that documentary, The Invisible War. This, this strip and Gary Trudeau's attention to the issue kept it in the public sphere. It's not only these strips, though, that kept it in the public sphere. Uh, it's also the scandals that took place in the military themselves. But we'll talk about those when we get to data. The next popular culture reference I'd like to just flag for you is the legislative struggle over how to change in response to military sexual assault. And this played out quite, um, quite close to reality in House of Cards in 2013, uh, a, a theme in that popular um, show. So we had video streaming of the military sexual assault legislative debate happening in this popular show. So in terms of public discourse, scandals have shaped the, uh, the public's understanding of this as much as uh, the popular culture representations, including the documentary that I mentioned. Those scandals uh, have occurred at regular intervals. The first one, which I remember well, I was working in Cheyenne Mountain in, in uh, Colorado Springs in a NORAD. Uh, uh, I was in a joint command, United States Space Command at the time. We w I worked in the Space Surveillance Center. We were tracking everything in orbit around the, uh, the Earth. We were watching what went up and what came down. Uh, in 1991, the tailhook scandal took hold. And some of you might remember that. That's the first time that intramilitary sexual assault really started to take hold of the public imagination because of the, the, uh, the type, types of offenses, that is blue on blue, we sometimes call it, within the military, military, military service members assaulting others uh, within the services. And in particular, the, the, the scandal of the tailhook named for the Naval Aviators Convention at which these assaults took place in a gauntlet in a, ho in a hotel where women were groped and assaulted by, uh, by mostly drunken men. The, uh, the public response was much worse because of the, the cover-up that followed the tail hook set of incidents, where the Navy was slow to investigate and initially didn't follow up on reports of sexual assault and sexual harassment. But tail hook was hardly alone. Um, in 1996, at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland, there were Army drill sergeants accused of sex sexual assault, that is, rape uh, and, and sexual assault, including uh, one notorious rapist who's, who was sentenced to 25 years. That triggered um, a hotline that brought thousands of women forward claiming sexual assault and harassment at the hands of, of uh, fellow army uh, soldiers and some commanders. It also, the mid-90s also brought a series of scandals to the Air Force. I was teaching at the Air Force Academy in the mid-1990s when it came to us. It came to us in the form of um, a, uh, a, a sexual assault that took place during an Air Force training. So the Air Force Academy used to run its own survival training for pilots. They did it for all cadets at the Air Force Academy with the idea that all cadets, whether or not they would actually be in planes, um, needed to have this understanding of how to survive where they shot down behind enemy lines. This training was called Survival, Escape, Resistance, and, es and, and Evasion. It was the, the acronym was SERI. During this, this training program, the cadets would be released into the, the woods. The Air Force Academy is on a beautiful uh, site in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains outside of Colorado Springs. They were released into an area. They were told to evade capture for as long as possible. They were captured. They were put into a mock POW camp, and then they were liberated at the end to great acclaim. And after they ended this, because of the scandal I'll describe to you, many cadets felt terrible that this had ended because it had been such a formative experience for them. Um, I had a critique of it as manipulative and perhaps not appropriate, but, but that was driven by this experience. So one cadet during the course of this training was subjected to mock rape and sexualized abuse during his time in that prisoner of war encampment. Um, the fact that it was a male cadet to whom this happened and the fact that he suffered uh, grave psychological harm as a result is consistent with, with what we now understand to be the consequences of sexual assault and sexual harassment in the armed forces, including the fact that it affects very many men as well as women. So the numbers that Congresswoman Spears cited for 26,000 sexual assaults, and I'll talk about what sexual assault means because it's much more than rape. It's a, long, it's a, a wide spectrum of offenses that are from wrongful touching all the way to the penetrative offense of rape. But of that number of 26,000, more are men than are women. And that's because there's so many more men in the military. 
85% of the armed forces remain men, uh, although the rate at which women are likely to be assaulted is higher than the rate at which men are likely to be assaulted. It's not enough higher to make up for that, that massive disproportion um, in the, uh, their, their, their demographic representation. So in terms of public discourse, the military has provided a series of scandals, not only those from the 1990s, that cadet that I talked about actually went on the news show 2020 uh, and, and brought a case litigating against the, uh, the Air Force to uh, be compensated for the harm that came to him as a result of that. It also ended the Siri program at the Air Force Academy. It now only takes place uh, within, with professional trainers after commissioning for those who are going to be uh, pilots and other air crew members in, in, in the service. Other scandals also took place right up to this day. Lackland Air Force Base, for instance, in 2012 had another scandal where, where military training instructors, who are the Air Force's equivalent of drill sergeants, were accused of and convicted of raping and sexually assaulting trainees, the recruits who were there. Lackland is the portal for the Air Force. It's where all the enlisted uh, members of the Air Force first come for training. So those scandals continued to keep this issue in the public eye. Uh, without the popular culture piece, though, in recent years, I don't believe they would have made that much difference because of the fatigue that seems to come. News cycles bring more information, but the popular culture that seized these issues uh, really kept it in the in, it kept the attention of the public for longer, and then the attention of, of political figures too. So I wanted to talk too about data. You heard some data already from Congresswoman Speer. I won't belabor that too much, but let me tell you where most of the information has come from about what we know about military sexual assault. There's two primary surveys from which we've uh, drawn the numbers that, that Congresswoman Speer used, that 26,000 sexual assaults in 2012. There were two surveys, one in 2010 and one in 2012. The 2010 one gave the 19,000 number that you saw in the Doonesbury Strip. The, the, uh, the 2012 one gave the 26,000 number that you heard from Congresswoman Speer. Those were both workplace and gender relations surveys. They were, they were completed not to identify the, the incident rate of crime, but instead to identify whether or not uh, an incident had taken place by persons who were in a particular workplace. Uh, they didn't have the follow-up that criminal justice, criminal victimization surveys generally do, and they've thus been, I think, appropriately criticized as perhaps overestimating, in some respects, the number of persons who were assaulted, and I think perhaps underestimating the number who were assault assaulted in other ways. Let me give you one example. So, I'm not an empiricist, so those of you who are, forgive me if I'm sloppy with the social science, but I spent a lot of time in this panel listening to statisticians, so I think I can fake it pretty well. Um, the, if, you ask, if you ask survey respondents if they've been subjected to a traumatic event within the previous 12 months, those who have been um, are likely to answer yes to that question. What about those who were subjected to a violent traumatic sexual assault two years before, or five years before, or 10 years before? They've never had a chance, perhaps, to report that this had happened to them they may well draw their experience into their response and therefore report positively that they were a victim of an assault within that period of time. So when you want a time-bounded survey, you generally need to do follow-up to make sure that the incident actually uh, did occur within the time period that you set out, especially when you're asking about something as potentially searing and difficult to forget and sometimes difficult to remember clearly and place as a sexual assault. That sort of follow-up is expensive it's not always done in surveys. The panel that I was on recommended that that be done in the future, but it wasn't done for the workplace and gender relations surveys, which were really intended to measure the climate at a workplace rather than to measure the victimization rate in terms of sexual assault. Now here's another example of how that data actually may undercount the incidence of sexual assault. Many sexual assaults that take place, we think, and I'll talk about why we don't know more about this and I can't be more definitive, are, are occur in a domestic violence context. A workplace and gender relations survey does not ask about domestic violence incidents clearly. So in some cases, and this, this is still true in the military's numbers as they're counted today, incidents of sexual assault that take place in domestic violence uh, situations aren't always counted in the figures that the military releases on sexual assault. That makes it tough to know exactly what the data means that we're talking about. One unmistakable piece of the uh, the data that's come forward are the narratives of survivors. And I'm gonna just, I'm not gonna play a narrative of a survivor, just so you know what to expect, but I am gonna play a brief um, a clip from some of the hearing, one of the hearings that Senator Gillibrand convened, where 
survivors of military sexual assault are introduced. We're now going to welcome the next panel. You can come up and I'll uh, read a biography that's very brief of each of you while you get settled. Um, we have Anu Bhagwati, who is the executive director and co-founder of the Service Women's Action Network. Anu is a former captain and company commander. She served as a Marine officer from 1999 to 2004. While serving, Anu faced discrimination and harassment as a woman in the military and has borne direct witness to military's handling of sexual violence. We have Bridget McCoy, former specialist in the U.S. Army. Bridget served in the U.S. Army from 1987 to 1991. She was just 18 years old when she signed up to serve her country in the first Gulf War. While stationed in Germany from 1988 to 1991, she was sexually assaulted by a non-commanding officer. We have Rebecca Havria, former sergeant in the U.S. Army. Rebecca served in the U.S. Army from 2004 to 2008. She was the only female member of a bomb squad in eastern Afghanistan and was attacked by a colleague at Salerno Forward Operating Base near the Pakistani border during her last week in country in 2007. We have Brian Lewis, former Petty Officer 3rd Class U.S. Navy. Brian enlisted in the U.S. Navy in June of 1997. During his tour abroad, USS Frank Cable, AS-40, he was raped by a superior non-commissioned officer and forced to go back out to sea after the assault. I encourage each of you to express your views candidly and tell us what is working and what is not working. Help us to understand what we can do to address this unacceptable problem of sexual assaults in the military. Uh, we will hear your opening statements. Your completed prepared statements will also be included in the record. Okay, so that, that's Senator Gillibrand introducing survivors of military sexual assault. She's not the first member of Congress to do that. We have more C-SPAN coverage of her, however, doing that than some others. Um, Congresswoman Speer was one of the first. She took to the floor of the House and read the narratives that had been sent to her from individuals who survived sexual assault. The narratives that appear in the documentary, The Invisible War, Invisible War, also had a very powerful impact on members of Congress and demonstrating the need to go forward. There's no member of the armed forces to whom I spoke about any of these issues who was unmoved by the stories of individuals who felt so betrayed, not only by the fact that they were assaulted by a fellow service member, but by the fact that their report of that assault wasn't investigated properly and that they suffered career consequences, uh, potential reprisals, and, uh, and uh, mental and physical health consequences as a result of those assaults. So after Senator Gillibrand um, seized this issue, and others did as well in the Senate um, and in the House, the pressure for change became very strong. And I'm going to play this next clip from June uh, hearings of the, the Senate Armed Services Committee, where Senator Levin describes the number of different bills that have been introduced uh, and gives you a sense of how many competing bills there were in Congress uh, and what the, um, the intensity of the military response to change. Now you can see uh, that lineup right there. Those, there are a lot of stars in, uh, that, in the uh, people who came to talk to uh, Senator Levin um, about this particular issue. Seven bills relating to sexual assault have been introduced in the Senate beginning in March and are now pending before the committee. Senate Bill 538, introduced by Senator McCaskill and others on March 12th. Senate Bill 548, introduced by Senator Globachar and others on March 13th. Senate Bill 871, introduced by Senator Murray and others on May 7th. Senate Bill 964, introduced by Senator McCaskill and others on May, on May 15th. Senate Bill 967, introduced by Senator Gillibrand and others on May 16th. Senate Bill 992, introduced by Senator Shaheen and others on May 21st. And Senate Bill 1041, introduced by Senator Blumenthal on May 23rd. More than 40 senators have sponsored or co-sponsored one or more of these bills. There's good reason for this legislative activity. The problem of sexual assault is of such scope and magnitude that it has become a stain on our military. Last year, for the fourth year in a row, there were more than 3,000 reported cases of sexual assault in the military, including 2,558 unrestricted reports and an additional 816 restricted reports. Restricted meaning that in accordance with the victim's request, 
They were handled in a confidential manner and not investigated. A recent survey conducted by the Department of Defense indicates that the actual number of sexual offenses could be considerably higher as 6.1 percent of active duty women and 1.2 percent of active duty men surveyed reported having experienced an incident of unwanted sexual contact in the previous 12 months. Even one case of sexual assault in the military is one too many. Nobody who volunteers to serve our country should be subjected to this kind of treatment by those with whom they serve. The problem is made much worse when the system fails to respond as it should with an aggressive investigation that brings the perpetrators to justice. The recent documentary, The Invisible War, has provided tragic and heartbreaking examples of some of these system failures. Every member of this committee wants to drive sexual assault out of the military. The question for us is how can we most effectively achieve this objective? We have previously, in some cases, as recently as last year's National Defense Authorization Act, taken a number of steps to address the problem of sexual assault in the military to ensure the aggressive investigation and prosecution of sexual offenses and to provide victims of sexual assault the assistance and support that they need and should have. For example, in the area of training, <coughs> We have required sexual assault training for service members <coughs> excuse me, at each level of military education. So Senator Levin was describing um, the, uh, the number of bills in Congress. I'll just note that this is exactly when the panel to which I was appointed uh, began, and we were supposed to uh, measure the effect and uh, recommend whether or not any of those 40 bills that were pending in Congress should be enacted. Um, we were, we were initially given 18 months to do all the things we were asked to do, but they really needed almost immediate responses from us on all these bills that were pending, and it was virtually impossible for us to measure their effect. It's a sort of a counterfactual uh, 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 exercise to guess at what the impact would be of many, many different proposals for what we might change in the armed forces that would reduce the incidence of or would improve the responses to sexual assault. So let me move to this next part, which I hope is not um, garbled at this point, the improving military responses part. I, these are in different colors here because the first set are about preventing sexual assault and the uh, last set are about responding appropriately within a criminal justice system to a report of a sexual assault. So the, the first three, the armed forces has done much in each of these arenas since the pressure especially has increased in recent years. In response to the very first scandal, the tailhook scandal, the armed forces did implement training. That training was not very effective. I, I remember it only vaguely. Mostly I remember the derision with which it was received. Uh, now the training is much more cohesive, uh, much more comprehensive, and much more effective. The uh, Trying to encourage the right kind of behavior among service members before a sexual assault occurs is a big part of what the military wants to do to prevent sexual assault. Likewise, on college campuses, preventing sexual assault is, is certainly in part about encouraging positive norms of respect, uh, dignity, autonomy, uh, maintain, uh, ensuring consent in sexual relations. So that first piece applies not only in the armed forces but outside. The armed forces does have an advantage in that it has a very captive audience. I'm grateful to be an educator and to have captive audiences on occasion, as you are right now. But when I was an Air Force officer, I had much more captive audiences. When I gave a lecture in the Air Force Academy's first ever Sexual Assault Awareness Week, I had a thousand cadets in the auditorium who had to listen to me. Uh, it's different um, in the military. However, the backlash against that sort of mandatory training is also real. So it's not a simple process of changing minds through that training. The second piece here, collect and publish useful data. The Response Systems Panel pushed to publish more data. The Armed Forces uh, have sometimes released an avalanche of data, have sometimes released only parts of it. We, for instance, asked them to release to academic researchers the, uh, uh, the actual responses that they received to those workplace and gender relations surveys that I uh, described. 
because if they released not only their analysis of it, but the actual data itself, we would have more confidence with external analysis and study, audits essentially, about the conclusions that were being drawn from that information from expert social scientists who could assess the information. Likewise, when I say useful data, there's a reason for that. Congresswoman Speer described the number of reported cases, the uh, number of prosecutions, the number of convictions, the number of uh, uh, convictions that resulted in time served. Using data like that to assess a criminal justice system's response is very dangerous without great care. What each of the services has done now is create what they call waterfall slides to try to describe what happens from the beginning when a person reports a sexual assault to the end when there's some final adjudication and sentence. There are many reasons that initial report may not end up in uh, severe or even mild punishment for the person who's been accused. The first was referenced by Senator Lennon as well as uh, S S Congresswoman Speer, and that is the restricted reports. In the armed forces, an individual, and it used to only be active duty s service members, now it's been expanded to include dependents and others, uh, could could report a sexual assault, get services that they needed in order to recover and to return uh, to uh, being effective in their military duty and to managing their life in the way that they ought to be able to without triggering an investigation. That's this restricted report. If a person reports in restricted, there is no investigation that ensues. The reason for that is to solve the toughest problem in trying to address the issue of sexual assault, and that's the very low rate of reporting. The estimates that we saw as we heard evidence from experts on this in the response systems panel was from 5 to 25 percent of sexual assaults are reported. Why are they not reported? The most common reason that's stated for not reporting is the person did not want anyone to know. Unpacking that sort of response to a sexual assault is very difficult. Understanding the validity and even the wisdom of that response is also a part of understanding this particular type of crime within our society. So part of that encouraging norms of positive sexual behavior, collecting and publishing useful data is understanding why people don't report and why we, how we might encourage them to do so. Some of this is about the sheer numbers. Um, one in, one in uh, six, one in five women on college campuses are likely to be victims of sexual assault according to the numbers that we have. The numbers are just about the same for child victims of sexual assault. Uh, the most devastating emotionally visit that we made while I was on this panel was to a treatment center in the state of Washington for child victims of sexual assault, which was a brilliant response center to help manage this, but was devastating the number of victims that they helped actually in that center. Recognizing that that many individuals have suffered this sort of uh, crime, have been victimized by this while they're children, helps to destigmatize the reporting process and make people understand they can reach out and get help and that others are in them with it. That's related to the final point in white there about cultural training and responses, education, and that's to support and involve victims in any reform efforts. One of the arguments that I made that repeatedly failed um, about whether or not the commander should be in the military justice process was all of these victims, as the ones you saw in the hearing that Senator Gillibrand introduced those former service members, uh, every one of the victims, but for maybe one who came before us, said, you have to get the commander out of the process. The convening authority makes us not trust the system, makes it not fair, and we feel more like the commander will protect those of long service and stellar records rather than me, who is perhaps a young enlisted person who doesn't have a, a lot of authority in the military. Um, supporting and involving victims in the process is something the military has embraced, but it has not embraced their recommendations for reform. What the Armed Forces has said in response to that is the system now is different. We're doing better. We will support victims. We're giving you legal counsel now, actually, throughout the process. We want, to we want to hear you, but we don't want policy today to be made by what happened 20 years ago. And in some instances, uh, the stories are, are sometimes from the deeper past that have been among those narratives of military sexual assault. The second set of responses there that can improve what the military can do and, and is working to do here um, go to the quality of the process itself that is triggered when a sexual assault is reported. There needs to be an independent and impartial tribunal. I don't think that can be the case when the c commander, the convening authority, makes the decision about prosecution. If the convening authority makes the decision to prosecute, selects the members of the court-martial panel, which serves as a jury, and then has a role in post-trial clemency, 
I, I don't find that an independent and impartial process. Neither, neither does the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which forced the European system to which uh, that are subject to that court to change. Um, the system on which the United States military justice system is based is the British system. The British Articles of War were the model for the first uh, in the, the colonies, the early uh, Continental Army's Articles of War. That system has already changed to not have a commander in that process. The next point there, train and collaborate with civilians, that's also about having effective processes. The military shouldn't work by itself in trying to solve this problem. I've already mentioned college campuses to you. I'll mention that again later. There are similar problems that are faced uh, in both environments. There's some similarities in demographics. Um, there's some similarities in uh, the this, this structure of life and living and the collective nature of the endeavors that they face. Collaborating with civilians, especially in larger urban areas with, uh, with deep resources in, in terms of social services and support, certainly can make military responses better. One of the things we did on the response systems panel was travel to civilian uh, uh, facilities that process the forensic evidence from sexual assault cases to check on the timelines. Were they comparable at military processing centers? What about the uh, effectiveness of the tests? What about the social services that were provided and the integration of different elements of service? And then finally, and this is something that I'm not sure was anticipated by the members of Congress who uh, appointed us to the independent panel, uh, we need to balance resources. The panel came out in support of balancing resources for the defense of those accused of sexual assault, as well as supporting the prosecutors who have to sometimes prosecute quite difficult cases to prove. We can't have a justice system that doesn't protect the rights of the accused. We can't have defense counsel not able to, for instance, in the military, they can't right now subpoena anybody. Defense counsel don't have subpoena power. Defense counsel in, uh, in the military justice system uh, have to go through the uh, trial counsel, who is the prosecutor, to get an expert witness. Their resources flow through the commander for a uh, defense counsel, and therefore the trial counsel who works for the commander, although is not rated by the commander, but the trial counsel then petitions the commander to get resources for the defense. It's, uh, it's not, um, there's, there's not an even uh, uh, allocation of resources, and especially at a time when there's been such pressure to prosecute cases, and the impact of a prosecution is so profound. Most of the cases in the military are, are uh, what we'd call, that are going to court martial, are registrable offenses. That is, they place a convicted, a person convicted of, of those on a sex offender registry. That's a lifelong consequence for someone convicted at trial. To fail to defend them, provide them the resources to defend themselves at a trial is, is absolutely a mistake. So briefly, uh, this response systems panel, uh, there were nine of us, five were appointed by the Secret Secretary of Defense, four by the members of the House and Senate Armed Services Committee. We initially had 12 months, they reduced that to, uh, we initially had 18 months, they reduced that to 12. We uh, initially had, I think, 15 tasks, and then they added a few more. One of the tasks was, uh, let's see, I actually wrote them down for you, they're so broad, um, I just want to give you a sense when you have a chance to serve on one of these or when you read our reports, give us a break for not having been as complete as you'd like. Um, this is one of those, those uh, 15, and I was the chair of a subcommittee that got nine of the 15 initial charges. This was one, compare military and civilian systems for the investigation, prosecution, and adjudication of adult sexual assault crimes. Now, if somebody came to you with that as a dissertation topic, you would have a lot of questions uh, before you took that on. Um, another one, um, this is the one about legislation. Assess the strengths and weaknesses of current and proposed legislative initiatives to modify the administration of military justice and the investigation, prosecution, and adjudication of adult sexual assault crimes. They were, it was a huge set of tasks that we got. The staff we had was within the Department of Defense. Uh, we had judge advocates, uh, a, a team of lawyers, we, we probably had a dozen lawyers on our staff, as well as some experienced in investigation, who split into uh, support teams for each of the three subcommittees. The challenges of this um, are clear from the, the, uh, the breadth of the task that we were asked to do, uh, but the challenges also ran to the structure of the panel itself. You saw, one reason I play that clip from Senator Levin's hearing, is I wanted you to see what it looks like when that 
panel of uh, high-ranking military officers is standing there in front of you. And um, I, we faced quite a few of those because when we ask the military what it thinks, you know, there is no military. Nobody really was in the military. You were in the Army. You were in the Navy. You were in the Coast Guard. You were in the Air Force. You were in the Marine Corps. So none of those services are going to let the other service speak for them. And plus, they each have their own systems. They each have their own courts of criminal appeal for that point, for that matter. So they sent, we'd get not one person giving us a military view, but we'd get six people giving us a military view. Uh, and they all agreed on the commander should be in the center of the process. There were some retired military officers, retired general officers, who some of the advocates in this of change in this arena were able to find and who did testify to me persuasively about this. But mostly what we faced uh, were uniformed officers who felt very strongly that removing the convening authority from control of criminal prosecution would be the death of the United States Armed Forces. Okay, I'm going to skip those um, websites. Just uh, no, this is, we weren't the last of these. Um, I'll just bring this up for you if it loads here. Actually, it doesn't really matter. So we weren't the last. We'll go to this slide. We weren't the last of the uh, panels. We weren't the first uh, to look at this, certainly. Um, I think maybe we produced the most paperwork, but I'm not sure about that. We came up with a preliminary report. I, um, I, was, I served on two subcommittees. I chaired one, the Comparative Systems Subcommittee, and then I served on the role of the Commander Subcommittee. And the role of the Commander Subcommittee issued the preliminary report that said commanders should stay at the center of the process. That was issued before we were done with all of our investigation. But we felt some pressure early in the process to actually get something out there while members of Congress were debating the merits of different bills. So we went forward with that. Uh, there were 10 people on that subcommittee, four members of the, uh, of the panel, and then five outside experts who were appointed to that uh, panel by the Secretary of Defense. I was the lone dissenter on that group uh, for not having the commander be in the process. Then the subcommittee reports came out. Actually, many of the... Um, Many of the recommendations of the subcommittees did end up in the final report, which we issued in June of this year, but some of them did not. And the ones that mostly were left out were from my um, subcommittee, the uh, Comparative Systems Subcommittee. We made some recommendations about judges' authority. We thought judges should do sentencing. We were asked about sentencing guidelines and mandatory minimums specifically. That was one of the additional tasks that was tacked on after the initial list. And we recommended against mandatory minimums, and we recommended against sentencing guidelines, not least because the military justice system adjudicates uh, aggregate sentences, uh, they're unitary sentences. There's no breakout for the penalty for each offense if a service member is convicted of a number of different offenses. So we actually couldn't figure out if there were multiple crimes charged, what sentence had been adjudicated for a subpart of the total slate of criminal offenses that had been charged and, and uh, successfully prosecuted in a court-martial. So the system itself didn't give us the data that we would need to recommend some uh, uh, a building of sentencing guidelines. Uh, but we thought judges should do sentencing rather than court-martial panel members. The court-martial panel is the military equivalent of a civilian jury. It's not selected randomly, but it's selected uh, by the commander as the person's best qualified to serve on that panel. It has to be persons of an equal or higher rank of the person who's been charged. An enlisted person will get officer members unless they request, and they can request two-thirds enlisted members if they want enlisted members on their panel instead. We thought that it's very difficult to ask panel members to do sentencing if you want a rational system. We thought judges would be uh, better equipped to do that. We also, also recommended that judges uh, decisions in a pretrial hearing, which was changed during the course of our study here by uh, the a gang rape case from Annapolis that was had such a long investigation. In the preliminary investigation, there was such long questioning of the complainant in that case, t some 20 hours of that young woman, um, and this was in the pretrial investigation, that, uh, that Congress uh, immediately passed a change in that, in that investigation. We recommended that those investigations, with, which now are run by a military judge, they weren't always run by a military judge, um, they were run by an investigating officer who used to not need legal training, but now does. Um, we thought that person should, should be able to issue a binding decision not to prosecute, essentially, if there's no probable cause. But that's not the case right now. If that person, if that, uh, the, the hearing officer there, the, who is a military judge, says there's no probable cause, it still could be sent to trial by a uh, convening authority. But those uh, recommendations weren't accepted. There's others I could talk about, too, with respect to collateral misconduct. But if you, if you have questions on those, I'll be happy to take them. 
But these are some of the other groups. We weren't the last. There's a follow-on panel to this RSP. That one was the Judicial Proceedings Panel. It's meeting now. It's considering two primary issues that we punted. One is whether Article 120, which is the sexual assault statute, should be revised. It's been overhauled twice since 2006. It's very difficult for prosecutors to prosecute using a law that changes that often and that much. Um, so many judge advocates did not want us to change that statute, but it's, it's pretty deeply flawed. Right now, the American Law Institute is engaged in a, an updating of the model penal code's sexual assault uh, uh, provision for the first time ever and is experiencing a lot of trouble reaching consensus on that, including uh, on the uh, rape shield uh, parts of the, their recommendations. And those are some of the same issues that this panel is dealing with in the military. So the first issue is should the statute on sexual assault be revised? And the second issue is about victim privacy that that panel is focusing on now. And then the last group that I mentioned there is the Military Justice Review Group. So Secretary Hagel appointed this Military Justice Review Group uh, this year. It was, it's supposed to, it was initially to finish its work um, this fall. It's been delayed somewhat as the first comprehensive review of the military justice system in many decades. And the hope is that that would bring comprehensive proposals for reform that would not only focus on sexual assault, but on the military justice system overall. And that's headed by uh, the former Chief Justice of the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, um, Andrew Efron. So, I just have a couple more slides, and then I'll be happy to take some questions, channel through our expert question sorter, uh, Paul. Um, the, uh, the outcomes here. So what happened as a result of all this ferment and all this attention on issues of, of sexual assault in the armed forces? First, changes in regulations. Lots of changes. I'll give you one example. We visited Lackland Air Force Base shortly after the, scandals, the, the uh, scandal of military training and structures, sexual... Uh, engagement with, not always sexual assault, but also some sexual assault with trainees had brought, come to light and had been investigated and prosecuted. They had completely changed, the Air Force had completely changed the, the architecture of their training base. They cut windows in doors and rooms. They required that trainees check in every two hours to computers that were located in the halls. They assigned more personnel to supervise, so it would much, be much less likely, as it had been in the past, that one person would be responsible for a number of people by themselves. Uh, they also installed phones in the day rooms, where the, the sort of group rooms in the barracks. There hadn't been phones there before. They don't want recruits to be able to call anybody they want, so there were only pre-programmed numbers on them. They didn't want the only number to be there, the sexual assault hotline, so they added the weather to, to that. Um, <laughs> That's all new, That's a, uh, and there were cameras, cameras everywhere. We walked into the room, it was, um, it was like a TV show where they're breaking into the uh, casino and you're in the security room. There were an unbelievable number of uh, different camera angles that were set up. So that was the Air Force's solution to this problem, was really to throw technology at it and attempt to change this, the material structure and the degree of surveillance in order to reduce the incident rate for this. One of the members of our subcommittee was an expert investigator, uh, and he immediately looked at the cameras, and he's, uh, he has studied uh, sexual predators and understands that that is an important subset of those who commit sexual assaults and is an expert in assessing their behavior and stopping them. He looked at the cameras and said, these will not work. He said, I, I have, I've seen in the Walmart where the supervisor takes a woman in the back room, knows exactly where the camera angles are, knows exactly where they can be avoided. And he said, this, is, this, can't, this isn't going to work. Uh, they, I can already tell where somebody could be in order to evade the attention of those cameras. That said, that's an example of major changes in regulations. And it's not only the Air Force. All the services have changed things in order to try to reduce the opportunity for and increase the reporting rate of sexual assault. Next, statutory revisions. There, there have been dozens and dozens of changes in procedures. So in, in the, the law is literally that uh, the changes to the, the Uniform Code of Military Justice and then changes to the other uh, provisions that govern what happens when an assault is reported. For instance, changes that allow transfer of a victim after reporting an assault, changes that allow transfer of the, the alleged perpetrator after a, a, a victim a reporter, a report of sexual assault is made. Uh, changes uh, that say any reprisals um, will be uh, severely dealt with, uh, trying to impose more rigor on the protections for those who report. So many, many changes in this statute, almost too many to keep up with. The next thing that's changed is data collection and analysis. 
uh, and yet it's not standardized. So one, some of the recommendations that we made were to try to get the service to, to adopt one standard for how to count the disposition of sexual assault cases. We recommended the Army's method be adopted. That wasn't especially popular with those who weren't in the Army. Um, I don't know what will happen there, but the existence of all those different systems really makes it tough to compare. We're, we're, we're not comparing apples and apples so often when we compare data on sexual assault. That's true in the civil sector as well as in the military, and that poses some big challenges that I think smart social scientists can help us solve, but which we'll need more help on yet. The other outcome is we do continue to have commanders as prosecutors. Um, that, perhaps that, that will change. Uh, there certainly are fiery members of Congress, like the one you saw up there before, who will continue to fight on this. But it does seem to me that the armed forces have been willing to change everything but this. The armed forces went so far as to assign counsel to every victim who reports a sexual assault. Every person, perhaps a victim, perhaps not in that initial reporting stage, but every brave person who comes forward and reports a sexual assault they get a, a lawyer, a uniformed lawyer, who represents them throughout the process, from the report right through the adjudication that happens. Uh, that's uh, virtually unprecedented in the American criminal justice system. And it, it certainly worked to empower victims and make them feel more like they have an opportunity to, uh, to be heard throughout the process. And then the last thing, um, perhaps this was inevitable, it's certainly a good thing in many respects, but the armed forces have been part of the pivot towards college campuses in terms of congressional attention to sexual assault. The military is tired of being the focus of, uh, of uh, concerns about sexual assault. They say it's no worse for us than it is anywhere else. And in fact, it's really bad at college campuses. Look right there. Um, and it's a comparable demographic. And you know, they're not entirely wrong. So, and we're rightly having to deal with the consequences of not having dealt with this as effectively as we should have in the past. I will say though, as an administrator now, that we lack the resources in general to do the sorts of things that the armed forces are doing uh, on their bases and posts and in their training. So the challenges are somewhat different to implement the right sort of prevention and response um, procedures on campuses as compared to military bases and posts. <clears throat> and just my last slide, this is a gesture towards um, a few of the things I talked about and some of the things that I think we need your help to figure out. The first I just mentioned, what's the difference between civilian and military sexual assault? You know, in many respects, I'd say very little. Most of the sexual assaults prosecuted in the military are similar to those that occur on a college campus. They're alcohol facilitated, they occur between service members who are between 18 and 24 years old, um, and that they're, in general, I think, not committed by someone who is, has committed such a crime in the past. Um, that's most of them. But there's also other crimes, other types of sex crimes out there. There's a, a, a powerful and convincing and troubling literature on sexual predators. I referenced that before. Serial predators who have multiple victims who are the best argument, <clears throat> pardon me, for reporting. When we talk <clears throat> to service members about why they should report, if we, if it, it, it's always hard to report an offense. But if you think that person will reoffend later, that's a powerful incentive to report. So understanding those differences, I also think there's differences in the military with respect to the culture of the armed forces, the history of sexual violence in the armed forces, and the um, celebration of masculinity. There is no Abu Ghraib equivalent quite in the, in the civilian, civilian sector. The second, independent versus in-house reform. The legal counsel program for victims in the Air Force was an in-house reform. It's a big program and it's making a difference. The independent panel that I was on was hamstrung in some respects. It's, I think that you probably need both. The next is measurement versus optics. No matter what data we come up with, it will be spun. And we have to remember that difference between how things look and what we're actually measuring. Next, education versus justice. The right result in every case is not a criminal prosecution. <coughs> in some cases, justice is better served with education and with allowing that victim to come to terms with what happened. And then the last point, I don't actually know the myth versus reality here yet. We don't have enough information. We need more research on this. There's so, the, the research on this is so thin. When we only know five to 25% of the actual incidents of this crime, it's harder to study than virtually any other sort of crime. We need more evidence about what actually happens. 
one of the interesting areas of study is the, the different types of militaries, the different types of environments that have low rates of sexual assault versus high rates. We need much more information on that. And I think that will come um, in the future, so long as we continue to pay attention to this issue. For the US Armed Forces, I hope that it's not going to go away again. I hope the problem reduces, but I hope the attention to it doesn't, doesn't diffuse before we actually get closer to solutions. OK, with that, thank you for your attention, as I talked for a while. And um, I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Hillman. Um, we have a number of questions, um, some of which are rather specific, and then a number of them go to macro topics about the architecture of military justice. So let me start with a couple of the specific questions, and then we can close by trying to take a, a whole lot of the architecture questions which fit together. Um, the first question is, please clarify the language used tonight. Uh, there were 26,000 reports of sexual assault in the 2012 report, but far more assaults actually took place, given that up to 90% of victims never report, according to Army data. That's a great question. <clears throat> so the Workplace and Gender Relations Survey asked for persons who had been victims of sexual assault, uh, not asked whether they had reported it. So that's 26,000 people who said in that year they had been the victims of a sexual assault, not that they had reported it. Um, the follow-up questions asked about why they didn't report and what they did, uh, and so those, those numbers, that 26,000 is an extrapolation from the number of people who reported. The question did ask, did you report? Then it asked what happened, but if it said they didn't report, then the, uh, it asked why they didn't report, and there were a whole series of responses that the uh, respondents could choose as they answered that question. Uh, so the, uh, the extrapolation, the, the numbers from five, when I said five to 25 percent, those are specific to particular groups where we have a survey and we have a number of reports. So for instance, the, during that period, the military got a certain number of reports. Based on the survey, there were this number of incidents, 26,000, and that's where you got the uh, approximately 20% sort of reporting rate. I hope, I hope that helps clarify the difference in those numbers. Thank you. The second question is, those of us who are gay or lesbian and were raped by a fellow airman while on active duty could not report the rape or we would have been discharged with less than honorable conditions because we're gay. Are there any legal resources for us after our VA claim has been denied? And the questioner says, thanks very much for speaking out about this. Yes, there are legal resources. Uh, in San Francisco, Swords to Plowshares is the best place to go uh, to help connect you to an attorney who can uh, address this through the veterans claims process. The end of the don't ask, don't tell policy uh, has been a huge, that's another reason I didn't list here, among the reasons that this issue has been more effectively grappled with by the military, because until we had the end of don't ask, don't tell, we couldn't have either men or women, and it wasn't only those who were assaulted by a member of the same sex um, in a, a uh, uh, a uh, connection in a in a uh, in a, either a tragedy or a relationship, um, the same kinds of sexual assault that take place in in opposite sex relations. But sometimes it was women who couldn't report that they had been assaulted by a man because the man threatened to out them as a lesbian, uh, it, and that was a. a an effective way to suppress reporting too. That's not the case anymore. It's not gone, of course, the stigma and the challenge and the difficulty around sexual orientation difference and integration within the armed forces, but it's certainly very different. But there is legal recourse. There's increasing numbers of um, legal resources that are dedicated to veterans and these sorts of veterans claims in particular. Um, the American Bar Association also runs a site I think it's called Homefront, but if you type in Veterans Legal Resources on the ABA site, you'll get a series of referrals and collective um, um, sites that collect the, uh, give you a place to go in order to try to find more help to navigate the very complex and cumbersome uh, VA process. Uh, I would add to that urging people to contact Swords to Plowshares. Um, my law firm represents that group. 
uh, and we also have a pro bono program that represents uh, disabled service members in VA claims. So if you have one of those problems, I would urge you to contact Swords to Plowshares or other former service member groups uh, because there, there are a number of legal aid avenues available to you. So the next several questions um, relate to the architecture of military justice and then another, a number of possible variants on it. Um, to set this, for, for people who are in the audience who are not lawyers and not military veterans, it might be helpful first if you gave a, a macro level overview of the architecture of military justice comparing it to civilian, and particularly the present role of commanders in that process. And then there's about four interlocking questions that'll flow off of that. Okay, I better talk fast. Uh, the in the uh, military justice system is really quite similar in some respects to a civilian justice system. There's a prosecutor, there's a trial that you would recognize, the rules of evidence are very similar, there's a defense counsel that's appointed by the military for somebody who's accused. You have to be accused of specified offenses, um, there, it has to be a violation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The difference is in who decides that you're going to trial. That's the convening authority in the military system. In a civilian system, it's a civilian prosecutor, elected or appointed in the jurisdiction where the crime is committed. The military, it's the convening authority. And the military has jurisdiction over you if you're a service member anywhere in the world and for anything you do wrong, including such catch-all categories as conduct on becoming an officer and a gentleman and Conduct, on, conduct of a nature to bring discredit upon the armed forces, um, uh, conduct uh, detrimental to good order, and prejudicial to good order and discipline, um, or conduct of a nature, uh, the, 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 the discredit piece and the, uh, the, the uh, disorderly piece, those are huge catch-all categories. So you can be criminally charged in the military for bouncing checks, um, for all sorts of things uh, that relate to your, uh, your violation of military norms of behavior. That's the, so the types of things you can be charged with are different in addition to all of those crimes. The commander, the convening authority gets the advice of a staff judge advocate who's a senior uh, lawyer who advises him or her about whether or not to press charges, but they're not bound by that advice. The convening authority still makes the, um, the decision. The, the convening authority does get some legal training, but is not a lawyer, uh, uh, except for the, those who are convening authorities in the JAG Corps who have that by virtue of their professional duties. Okay. Um, and the convening authority, I take it, is a synonym for the commanding officer of the particular um, section in which the um, accused finds him or herself. Sort of. Here we get into the complexity. So it really, it, it's normally someone of relatively high rank. And one right. of the changes Congress made was to remove that authority to a higher point for sexual assault offenses. So a, it wouldn't be if, for instance, when I was at the Air Force Academy, I was a captain. I worked in the Department of History. My, uh, d my department chair was a, was a uh, colonel. The dean of the faculty was a, a one-star general. The convening authority would be a three-star general, probably, above all of us there. So it wouldn't, it would be unlikely to be somebody who was directly involved with the individual. It would be likely to be someone relatively far removed who was making a decision with the advice of a lawyer. Okay. So with that very helpful description of the uh, architecture, uh, one of the specific questions here is, what is the military's argument against taking assault out of the chain of command? Other than it's their quote, responsibility to keep good order, close quote, um, especially with so many, um, so many high-ranking officers being exposed as participating in or turning a blind eye towards sexual assault. So the, the question is kind of packed in two different questions there. Okay. The first, uh uh, the leaders in the armed forces would disagree that many high-ranking officers have disregarded or failed to uh, appropriately respond to sexual assault reports, but they would admit that some do, uh, and that's uh, that's a sort of that's the the framing of that would be important to them. They'd say when that goes wrong, we need to correct that problem because that convening authority acted inappropriately, but that doesn't prove a problem with the system itself. They argue that the convening authority, this high-ranking commander, ought to retain the power 
to control prosecution because it's what we've always done in the U.S. military, because the U.S. military sends its service members into harm's way in more dangerous and challenging missions than what other countries do. Uh, some of the comm commanding officers who came before us talked about being in multinational deployments where they sent their troops into uh, into situations where they did not want someone other than a, a commander, a convening authority, to be able to potentially prosecute that individual for anything that happened in the course of that mission because they viewed that as a failure to protect that service member who was acting at the behest of command. In other words, it's a protection for service members, so goes the argument, for commanders to retain the authority against being charged, for instance, for war crimes by a civilian jurisdiction or by an international criminal court or by someone who didn't understand the risks that were asked to be taken and the responses of that service member. Um, there, was, there were also arguments that the service, the service member, the commanders would lose interest in this if they uh, weren't um, obliged to, to decide about prosecuting, that if you took, if you didn't make them responsible for it, they wouldn't continue to pay attention and they wouldn't be as committed and service members wouldn't take as seriously their obligation to help end the sexual assault within the ranks. So a related question from another questioner is what are your thoughts about taking the reporting and then prosecution of military sexual assault out of the military chain of command? I think we should clearly do that. I, I don't. I don't think it helps commanding officers do their job to have to make these decisions. I, I think that I think prosecutors have a very tough job. Maybe some of you here are prosecutors or have been or aspire to be. Uh, prosecutors are officers of the court. Their job is to seek justice. Their job is not to get get convictions. We ask them to make tough decisions with the information they have. We've developed models where they cooperate with investigators and with victim advocates to uh, understand the case and to develop a case as it goes forward. I think prosecutors should make these decisions and not commanding officers. I think we've put commanding officers in a terrible position. It's almost a no-win position. They prosecute harshly all of these cases that come for forward. It's, you know, the incredible resources that go into these, there's no plea bargains in these cases because of the consequences of them. Now there's a, a one-way ratchet, too, in the review process. If I'm a convening authority and I decline to prosecute in a sexual assault case, it goes up to my boss. And so that person, even farther removed from whatever happened, with uh, more legal counsel, and one of the proposed changes sent them to the Secretary of Defense. I think Secretary Hagel has a lot to do, but deciding on a sexual assault case, I think these are important. But, you know, elevation of authority to decide doesn't lead to better decisions in every case. No disrespect, Chancellor Blumenthal. So. Um, <laughs> And I think in some of these cases, what we've done actually is put someone in a position that they're absolutely not prepared for. At least the convening authorities right now have training and have a staff judge advocate who's normally had experience on both defense and prosecution as well as other legal services to advise them. But to put this in a staff office like the Secretary of Defense, it, it doesn't make much sense. Okay. What about the policy alternative of letting the JAG Corps make those decisions autonomously of the convening authority. I like that. I think uh, judge advocates are professional lawyers. Uh, I think that they, they're admitted to the bar. Of, they have to be admitted to the bar of a state. There is no separate military bar. They're, uh, they're also subject to sanction by the bars to which they're admitted, in addition to being a, a part of the armed forces and subject to the disciplinary codes of the military. I think that's a better solution. Um, I, I like the, I, I wonder about the costs of having a, a military legal corps that's expert in all aspects of criminal justice prosecution, given the way the armed forces is spread out around the world and the availability of alternative civilian prosecutors who do have expertise in sexual assault prosecution and sexual assault investigation. I wonder at that from an efficiency and logic standpoint, but in terms of fairness and justice, I would rather have uh, military lawyers, judge advocates, many of whom are, are just terrific lawyers making those decisions. You have foreshadowed the uh, next question, <laughs> which is, um, if you had as one policy alternative letting JAG Corps officers make those decisions, what about the other policy alternative of having civilian attorneys make those charging and prosecution decisions um, as to sexual assault cases? I like that too. Uh, to me, the uh, impartial and independent tribunal is, is really what we want. Um, the conflicts that are embedded in commanding officers making decisions are really the thing to be avoided. I also think that 
it is rare, the military case of sexual assault that is so distinctively military that no civilian could ever possibly comprehend what was happening there. I just, I don't believe that. So um, I also think, and I wrote, I wrote a piece about this called Front and Center, Sexual Violence and, uh, and the Military. I feel like sexual violence has been at the center of so many military legal precedents and has been so much a part of the history of warfare that I'd like to break that chain. I'd, I'd prefer that these sexual assaults didn't get prosecuted in the military at all. Thank you, but we're not very close to that policy alternative, so. So as to that last alternative, uh, if a separate and independent civilian authority uh, were charged with those prosecution decisions. What is your estimation of their ability as civilians to effectively investigate, assemble evidence, charge, prosecute, and win cases as distinguished from serving JAG officers uh, who, who do have the title of military and are, are part of, in, in effect, within the tribe as opposed to outside? A, a good, an important consideration. So can somebody from the outside effectively investigate, get service members to trust them so that, I think that an, an independent decision maker doesn't mean it has to be an independent structure that would actually investigate. And uh, we'd still have military and security police. We'd still have investigated. We'd still have NCIS. Otherwise, what would happen to the TV show? Um, we, we, would, we, would, we could still have a decision maker at the top of those military structures that would make decisions based on the information that they brought in. On the on the other hand, we do often have incidents of sexual assault by service members that are investigated by civilian authorities. If a soldier at Fort Benning, where I went to airborne school one very hot summer, um, goes out in Columbus, Georgia and uh, commits a sexual assault on a civilian, that civilian reports it to a, a civilian law enforcement agency, they start the investigation. They, they've already begun, they may not even realize the person is a, a soldier at Fort Benning until uh, relatively late in the process. So our military isn't that isolated in all instances from the rest of society that I think civilian investigators are that completely impaired with respect to figuring out what happened. Well, you've again foreshadowed uh, one of the prescient questions that our audience members asked. Um, what about having where possible, such as in the United States, as distinguished from a foreign jurisdiction. But what about the possibility, at least in the US, of having civilian authorities take, uh, take these cases within the normal civilian prosecution system? I like that idea. I think the biggest problem with it is resource allocation and the strapped nature of our courts and our criminal justice systems generally. Most of the agreements between big posts and the base, the uh, uh, cities uh, and counties that surround them with respect to criminal prosecution kick the, the um, military offenders back to the armed forces because the military has the will and the resources to actually investigate and prosecute and the civilian uh, prosecutors and investigators don't have it uh, in many instances and can't keep up with what's happening. Were there, if there's a competent and available civilian uh, uh, jurisdiction, then I think it's fine, but I, I think there's a resource reason that doesn't happen so often. Given that last comment, uh, what would be your policy recommendation for uh, leaving aside the politics of it and what could or could not get through the Congress? What would be your policy recommendation for the best practice of how to structure it? I, 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 this goes to a little bit of what I said before. I don't think it serves our... our um, our goals of having a fair and equitable military for all genders and sexual orientations, all ages and all different types of persons, to have a criminal justice system that is is uh, insular within the armed forces. I think the military needs to discipline service members and I think that military offenses should appropriately be prosecuted within military courts. But the kinds of things that the U.S. prosecutes at court-martial, arson, um, murder, uh, you know, uh, writing, writing checks, writing uh, fraud, um, larceny, the, these are prosecuted all the time in civilian courts. And the gravamen of the crime is not very often all that different uh, when a service member is prosecuted. Plus the rate of court-martial. When I wrote my dissertation 
so long ago, I can't even bear to think about it now. Um, I looked at what the court martial rate had been in the early 20th century versus after the enactment of the UCMJ. It declined by 90% because it got harder to court martial somebody. You couldn't, it's not summary justice anymore. I mean, when is summary justice more appropriate than when a soldier goes awry in the midst of battle and has to be stopped, right? Something goes wrong, soldiers are armed. These are different situations. That's not what we're talking about today. Most of the time when we talk about courts martial, we're talking about garden variety crimes, drug offenses for instance, that end up before military courts. I, I, don't, I don't see especially good reasons. That said, I, I, we're going the other direction in civil courts. I mean, veterans courts and courts that focus on the special needs of veterans uh, for, for instance, substance abuse and drug offenses that are providing special services to veterans. I think those are great models of rehabilitative justice and getting social services to people. I, I think not only veterans ought to get them, but lots of other people too. So that's, um, that undercuts my argument to pull this out of the military. But I think it's, uh, that's an appealing prospect to me because of the services in which that uh, adjudicative action is embedded, not because of who's controlling the, the action itself. Um, you mentioned uh, drug offenses and specialized drug courts. Um, one of the questions here has to do with uh, the phenomenon of homelessness among veterans. And do you see a correlation between veterans who have been subjected to sexual assault in the military um, and potential PTSD ramifications that might lead to homelessness. Absolutely, the uh, the rate of PTSD among female veterans is higher than the uh, uh, is higher for those who uh, experience sexual assault than for those who have been in combat. Um, it's clearly a part uh, the the consequences of it. You know, it's not always true that uh, a survivor of sexual assault suffers terrible consequences over the long term. But it is true that many do, and we need to adjust services to respond to those individuals. Um, I think that uh, solving the problem of homelessness, which like many other veterans issues, is an issue for veterans, but others as well, that's gotten much more attention in recent years uh, with building more housing for veterans in particular and trying to provide more services, but still not enough to address mental health. Uh, Dean Hillman, thank you very much for your work, and thank you for coming to talk with us this evening. Thank you for your patience with me.